Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time together and for your presence, that we can worship together, that we can pray for one another, uh, that we can be fed, Lord, and just receive from you that as we sow into this time, Lord, as we spend this time seeking your face, Lord, we know that we will reap a harvest of revelation, of blessing, um, of, Lord, you working in our lives. And I pray, Lord, we would have revelation on things that we haven't seen before and be encouraged as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we're going to look at a scripture, Luke 22 and verse 28. And this is Jesus speaking just before the Last Supper, or at that time, he's speaking to his disciples, and he says this, You have stayed with me in my time of trial. That's what he says. You have stayed with me in my time of trial. He's talking to the disciples. And whenever I read that passage, it always strikes me because we think, well, you know, he's the Son of God. He's fulfilling the mission of all eternity. And you're telling me he needs people? You're telling me he needs people, ordinary, very ordinary people, to just be there for him? To just walk with him and support him while he's the sa- going to be the saviour of the world? This meant something to him? That ordinary, grumpy, not very clever people would stand with him? Yeah. yeah. Big. Thank you. It's big. It was big to Jesus. And I think we need to learn if Jesus needed people, then we need people. We need one another. That's right. And other people need us. That's right. As brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. It's yeah. good. Yeah. We need each other yeah. and other people need you. And you're not going to do it on your own. And nobody sitting in this room is going to do it on their own. And we need to be aware, Scripture says, to be aware of the enemy's schemes. The enemy always wants to make us feel like, well, those people, they just, they get on your nerves. Maybe you should just withdraw. Maybe you should just withdraw and isolate and do your own thing. And you and Jesus, you can have a good thing going. And, you know, that is the, the enemy's language. Because we need to be together. We need to be supporting each other. So today, we're going to look at brotherly love. Depending on the translation, some translations say brotherly kindness. Some translations say uh, brotherly affection. Okay, but I've called it brotherly love. But it's the next step in our so rights. I thought about it this morning. I thought, just remember, so right. right. It's so right. Yeah. You know, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 11 is so right. Yeah. And what it means, so right, means it's each one of these steps, as we see in the, the picture there, each step builds on the one before. Yeah. So um, tonight, today, last week we had godliness, and today we're going to look at brotherly affection. So let's just bring up our, um, our standard scripture, please, Caleb, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 11. And uh, so we'll just keep going for time's sake. Yeah. So here it is. These are all the ones we've looked at so far. We're going to supplement our faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness. And today we're up to and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Some translations say brotherly love and then you supplement brotherly love with love for everyone. And it goes on to say that if we have these qualities, we'll never stumble. The more we build these qualities in our lives, we will never stumble. Now, I just want to clarify the difference between brotherly affection, because then it goes on, it says brotherly affection or love, and love. And so I just want to clarify that because um, in the Greek, 
Like we have one word for love. So I can say, I love God. I can say, I love Rick. But I can also say, I love ice cream. And I love watching tennis. And I love my dog. So it's all the same word, love. And we kind of know, we know what the person means, even though they're using the same word for different types of love. But in the Greek, they have a different word for their different types of love. They have a different word. So next week we're going to look at the word agape. And and Tara's doing that, I think. It's, It's the God kind of love. In fact, in classic Greek, it doesn't even exist in classic Greek because it was a whole new word that came out of the New Testament times. Yeah, a yeah. special God kind of love. Super, it's a supernatural love. Yeah. And she'll talk about that more. But today we're looking at a Greek word called Philadelphia. <coughs> Philadelphia. And it means brotherly love. And yeah, I've got a definition here. Um, Philadelphia, friend and brother means that in the New Testament this word was used to describe the love of Christians one to another. So it can mean love toward your fellow man. You know, just the milk of human kindness, so to speak, because someone's suffering, you you care for them. But it particularly in this instance means love for your brothers and sisters in Christ, brotherly love. And so the love Christians had one to another, brotherly love out of a common spiritual life. Yeah, beautiful. And so the Greek is Philadelphia. And you may know that there's a city in America called Philadelphia, and that was founded by a Quaker called William Penn. This is just a bit of side issue, side info for you. Uh, William Penn, he was a Quaker, and he founded the city of Philadelphia, and he called it that, because he wanted it to be characterised by brotherly love. So that's why it's often called the city of brotherly love, is Philadelphia. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah? So we're looking at that today. Now, what, how does it, what's the outworking of brotherly love amongst us today? And uh, one of the things, as I prepared this, I thought, man, this is so intensely practical. This quality is very practical. And I thought, you know, Jason and Tara, they've got it. Yeah. And, and it flows down into this body. Yeah. And when I, you know, I have to be honest, when I first came to this church, my, my last church wasn't so much like that. Um, it was a good church, but it, you know, it wasn't as big on this. And when I first came to this church, you know, Jason was always talking about community, I think that's his favourite word. Community and we'll, we'll have meals together and oh let's get together and one day I said to Rick, I feel like I'm suffocating on community. I'm sick of community. And so it's taken me, it's three years now, it's taken me that long to like it. <laughs> to like but it, that is what it this is about. It yeah. is, it, brotherly love is about community and helping each other. So I just want to look at some examples in uh, Acts 20, uh, in Acts. And this is all to do with Paul on the ship. You know, Paul, for those of you who've read Acts right through, Paul was on a ship and he did get shipwrecked. He was on his way to Rome. It was pretty dire time. And we're just going to look at a couple of scriptures to get an idea of what brotherly love means in a very practical way. So um, we're looking at Acts 27 and verse 3. And he's on this journey on the ship. He says, the next day we docked at Sidon and Julius, Julius was the centurion that was guarding them. He said he was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. You know, so Paul's on this ship, he's on his way to Rome, he's been in a prison for a couple of years, he's on his way to Rome, doesn't know what he's going to find, and something you may not know is that the Romans didn't feed their prisoners. They didn't feed them and they they didn't give them large screen TVs, and they didn't clothe them, they didn't do anything for their prisoners. So if you didn't have friends that would help you, 
you, you were going to have a tough time in a Roman prison. So Paul had some friends here, Christian brothers and sisters, who were with him on this journey to help him with his needs, to be there for him, to give him food and to give him water and to make sure he was warm enough. And they were there just for that. They were on this journey, which was quite dangerous, just for that. When I was doing some mission work in Kenya a number of years ago, one of the, the women on the compound was bitten by a black mamba. That's apparently the most deadly snake in the world. So she was bitten by a black mamba and taken to hospital. Well, in Kenya, uh, they, they, they don't give you the medication. Either your family or your friends have to bring the medication and pay for it, or you don't get it. And so she went to hospital and they said, yeah, she's been bitten by a black mum mamba. She needs this benign, this kind of benign. And um, so all the Christian brethren at the compound had to kind of get together and see how much money they had to pay for this benign, or she was going to die. So it's a situation that makes, makes you want to get on with your brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> or she was going to die. And so uh, when they pooled all their money together, they realised, OK, they went to the pharmacy and the pharmacy said, well, that's not enough money for the benign. Mm. OK, or the anti-benign, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so they said, all right, how much money is it for? What can we get for that? And uh, the, the pharmacist says you can get a tetanus shot. They said, give us that. <laughs> so they paid for that. And they took it to the, the doctors and they said, give her this and don't tell her what it is. And then they went back to the compound and they prayed. They prayed that it would work. And it did. Oh, wow. They prayed and it worked. And she didn't know it was a tetanus shot till she got back to the compound. And she was okay. But that woman's life was saved because she had brothers and sisters in Christ that cared about her. Yeah, wow. It's beautiful. Made a difference. Wow. So Paul, here we are again. He's, we've got uh, Acts 28 and verse 2. He got on shore. Okay, so there's a shipwreck. He nearly drowns. He gets to an island. He says, the people on the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. Just really practical, helpful stuff to someone who's struggling yeah. in a situation that's really tough. Just practical help. This is what brotherly kindness, brotherly affection is all about. Just being there. You know, when Jesus said, you are the ones who've stood by me in my trials, one of the things we learned, Rick and I learned when we were doing chaplaincy, was something they called the Ministry of Presence. The Ministry of Presence. And, and the thing was, was that was the value of being there for someone. The value of being there when someone's going through something. That's good. And it doesn't mean you can fix it. See, Jesus' disciples couldn't fix it for him. They couldn't save him from going to the cross. They couldn't save him from the persecution of the Pharisees. They couldn't make it right for him, so to speak. And we learned in chaplaincy, most of the time you couldn't make it right or fix it for the person in that bed. And some of them were just so sick. But the fact that you were there, the fact that you came, they knew you were a volunteer chaplain. They knew you'd come out, you'd spent time getting there, petrol, whatever, you'd done the training. Just to be there with them, it makes such a difference. That's good, sir. Yeah. And it makes such a difference in the body of Christ. You know, when people are in hospital or people like when um, Kirsten was sick and Phil and Inga were there and the, the ministry chat was lighting up all the time with people praying and wanting to know what's going on, and, and this is what it's all about. This is brotherly love. This is brotherly affection. That's good. Being there, that ministry of presence. And then Paul goes on because, you know, he got off the island of Malta, and in verses 14 and 15, 
It says there, they, they came ashore. He says, there we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them. That would have been wonderful after being in, in a shipwreck. Mm. And he says, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming. And they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at the three taverns. And when Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. You know, we, we sort of think Paul was, the, I mean, Paul was, he was an amazing apostle. But he needed that support. So often in his letters he says, oh, you sent time, time and again you sent refreshment, or time and again you sent what I needed. Because he was in prison. He wasn't being fed. Uh, you know, time and again he needed that ministry of presence. He needed uh, physical needs to be met. And he needed encouragement. Yeah. And it's the same today. We all need that. Our leaders need that need people to be alert and praying. Have you ever been driving down the, the road or doing something and, and you've got Raylene on your mind? Why is Raylene on my mind? <laughs> no, I understand. Like Gordon says, I have an important commercial to watch here. And it's the Holy Spirit trying to prompt you to pray for Raylene. Yeah. That's, right. That's why you've got Raylene on your mind. You know, sometimes you're doing something and the Holy Spirit will say, yeah. ring such and such. And I think, I don't need that. I, it's not in my diary. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And Holy Spirit's trying to say, ring them. They need your encouragement. They need something. There's something going on in the Spirit. Give them a call. So important to be connected. Like Scripture says, we're knitted to each other. We're knitted to each other. And if you, if you get a jumper, I used to knit, not now. But I used to, and if... You could have a stitch up here and you could pull a thread down here and you could pull that thread and make a hole up here, you know, because it's all knitted together. That's good, yeah. And we are knitted together as the body of Christ. You know, I work for a mission organisation and when I first went there, we did a lot of work in China and it was when it was sort of the church was underground in China and things like that. We had amazing testimonies. And one of the things we learned was the importance of believers praying for one another. And, you know, in, in Hebrews it says, pray for people in prison as though you're in prison. Pray for people being mistreated as though you're being mistreated. And I know we don't have that so much in this country, but we found it was so important. And one testimony in particular we had was when one of the contacts, amazingly and miraculously, it's another story, he, he got out of prison. He, w he managed to escape prison. He was put in prison for his faith, you know. And um, doors miraculously opened and he walked past guards who didn't see him even though looking right at him, all this kind of thing. But when he got out on the street, he didn't, he didn't know what would happen. But there were some brothers, Christian brothers, people who knew him, with a bicycle. They said, get on the bicycle. We're going to a place. We've got a place for you to hide. And so he got on the bicycle and he rode. They took him to a place. They took him inside. They had a special camouflaged room behind a wall. And they said, go in there and uh, here's some food and water. Here's supplies. Stay here until we say it's safe to leave. Because, you know, in the underground church there was persecution and things like that. He said... How did you know I was going to escape from prison this morning? They said, oh, we've been praying for you. The Holy Spirit told us. The Holy Spirit told us. And so we got a bicycle ready. We got food ready. And when, when, the, um, when the security police are gone, we've got a special way for you to escape to another farmhouse where you'll be safe. Wow. Wow. Because they were praying for one another because they were alert to the Holy Spirit on behalf of one another. And then they didn't just think, oh, brother so-and-so is getting out of prison today. They thought, he's going to need a bicycle. He's going to need food. He's going to need somewhere to stay. And so they made that happen. That's really good. You know, Inga and I, we've, we've known each other a long time, even before I came to this church. Um, 
Inga and I had a very, very lovely supermarket friendship. And uh, we used to run into each other in the supermarket aisles, didn't we, Inga? And clog them up. And so everybody had to keep saying, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Oh, sorry, sorry. We'd be doing this ch chatter, 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 you know, chatter. for a while. And um, <laughs> every time before we finished, and just as we were about to go, she'd say to me, could you pray for Jason and Tara? They're going through this or they're going through that. Could you pray for them? I'd never met Jason and Tara. I used to walk away looking at the cornflakes thinking, who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> but she always asked me to pray for Jason and Tara. Do you remember that? I was just automatic. She, Could you pray for Jason and Tara? I said, yeah, sure. And I would, as I walked away, I'd pray for them. I never imagined I'd be coming to this church. I never imagined one day they'd be my pastors. But she, she had such a connection, such a concern, such a, a sisterly love for Jason and Tara that without realising it, in a supermarket aisle, it just overflowed onto me. Then, you know, in amongst the Kellogg's cornflakes, I'm praying for Jason and Tara, who I didn't know from a bar of soap in those days. But that's how we're knitted together. Yeah. God knew I'd be coming here. God knew there'd be a connection. Yeah. And, that, and that's how it works, you know. Wow. Okay, let's look at some more scripture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. Are you right? That's not a timer. Um, okay. <laughs> he, says, he says this, But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. So there's just a call on our life to be allowing this to develop in our lives more and more, to be alert to it more and more, to, to be alert to the Holy Spirit prompting us and wanting to reach out more and more. We tend to live in a culture that... Um, you know, we is more isolated. Yes. It's becoming more isolated yes. where we just stay in our homes. And I and church tends can tend to be like that. Yes. Where we come in busy, we just sit down, we don't know who we're sitting next to necessarily, or we just, you know, we do it and, and we go back to our busy lives. But you know, God created the church to have covenant relationship yeah. with him and with one another. It's good. We're we're in covenant together. So let's look at another scripture, 2 Timothy 1 and verses 16 to 18. And this is about Onesiphorus. And I know you know all about, I know, are you, oh yeah, no, Onesiphorus, I know what this is going to be about, you know. Onesiphorus, I had to even, I had to even Google how to pronounce his name. <laughs> Onesiphorus. So it says here, Paul is talking and he says, May the Lord show special kindness to Onesiphorus, and all his family, because he often visited and encouraged me. Now notice, Paul doesn't say because he did lots of miracles, or even that he gave lots of money, yeah. or even that he was the best preacher in his church, or that he prayed the longest. He said he often visited and encouraged me. Yeah, did, did Paul really need that? Wasn't he the super duper apostle? Wasn't he the one who's written two thirds of the New Testament? He often visited, he was never ashamed of me because of my chains. This is a big deal in Paul's day because a lot of his followers were falling away and leaving him alone in prison. And, you know, we don't always, you know, we can't always get our head around it, you know, when, you know, where's Tara? Oh, she's in prison. <laughs> but Tara's not here today. She's in prison. Oh, Jason's not here today. He's in prison. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, this was happening in Paul's day where Paul, Paul's not making it to the conference. He's in prison. And a lot of people were getting put off by that, you know, and leaving him alone in this Roman prison with no food, no clothes, no nothing no help, and no encouragement. So he says, this guy, he didn't care about that. 
And when he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. Now, even for this guy to come to Rome was a big deal because in those days, Nero was starting to persecute Christians. In fact, this guy eventually was martyred for his faith. They think he was um, tied up to horses and dragged to death, one of Nero's favourites. But he came to Rome to search for Paul. Well, Paul was in prison. And, you know, Roman prisons weren't like here where you could just go to the foyer and go to the front office and say, I'm looking for the Apostle Paul. Um, can you tell me which dungeon he's in? Yeah. It, yeah. it was just, just this maze, maze of dungeons here and there and everywhere all over Rome. And he would have to go through each area looking for Paul. And go into an area and, oh, is that him in the corner? No, it's not him. You know, and this could take days, days yeah. to find Paul in Rome where persecution of Christians was just going bananas. Yeah. And so he's, he's risking his life. But as well as that, to get there, he had to, he, he travelled a thousand miles to get there. Which is kind of like from here to Adelaide. And this is, you know, in the first century. And he had to cross, uh, I've looked it up, and he had to um, cross three large bodies of water. And that's in, you know, they didn't have celebrity cruises in those days. <laughs> they didn't have P&O and Carnival. It was kind of just those funny little sailing boats that ran aground and shipwrecked quite often. And he, he did this. Because he heard that people were leaving Paul and that Paul was struggling and needed encouragement. That's why he did it. Beautiful. Travelled a thousand miles, risked his life on the open water, risked his life in Rome with all the persecution of Christians to be there with the ministry of presence for Paul. And, you know, I just want to encourage us, like we, we have busy lifestyles, in our culture. It's different um, to other cultures and things like that, but this is a quality. Uh, some of the Greek meanings behind some of these scriptures means um, work at it, get better at brotherly love, make an effort with it. So a cu couple more scriptures. In Romans 12 and verse 10, um, it says this, Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. So the Greek there, pretty much, it, it means love, it's the love between friends that is authentic, sincere, tender and warm. It's like the love between family members. It means we're meant to see each other as members of a family, like, like we are blood members of a family. And it means to value each other very highly, with no room for jealousy or competition. In fact, we value each other so highly that we don't mind if someone else succeeds more than we do. We so want each other to do well and succeed that we don't mind if they succeed more than we do ourselves. It's that, that idea that God want us, wanted us to be in covenant relationship where we really care. Jesus talked about laying down our lives for each other. You know, you're, you're my friends and I want to, it's more to do with agape, which is next week, but that idea of going the extra mile, caring about it. In Colossians 3 and verse, verses 12 to 13, it says... Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, the next one's a beauty. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. 
Now, in this, where it says, you know, clothe yourself. So the idea is, you know, in the morning, you know, before we were born again, we, you know, put on the underpants of hatred and the singlet of revenge and, you know, the, the jacket of I'm going to get you back and the shoes of I want to kick you if I can or trip you over and, and then we go out ready to face the world, you know. But when we're born again, when we're believers in the body of Christ, we go into our wardrobe and we put on tender-hearted mercy and, and we put on kindness. And we put on humility and gentleness. And it, it, that tender-hearted mercy is be ready to feel someone else's pain. Yeah. Be ready to feel someone else's pain and do something about it if you can. So not, not just to think, oh, yeah, they're going through a bad time. How's that working out for them? You know, like... Making just a loud, because the Holy Spirit will do this if you yield to him. He'll help you to see and feel what that person's going through. And he will prompt you to help in a certain way that's right for you. It, making meals is not good for me. Uh, that's not a good one for me. But I know lots of people in the church who are really good at it. <laughs> But there are ways the Holy Spirit will prompt you, either ring or be there for them or help them with transport or make a meal <laughs> or something, some way to help. But it's that idea that you feel their pain and you want to do something to help and not just think, well, I'm too busy, you know. And it also means the, the kindness, the humility, the gentleness. It means to become adaptable to the needs of those around us. Adaptable to the needs of those around us. So what, what do we mean by that? Okay, you know, we can, you can come across some people in the body of Christ and they, they're just like, well, I just don't like listening to people, especially when they're not making sense, so I just walk away. That's just me. You know, I'm busy, I haven't got time. Um, Rick and I know someone, their favourite thing is, I don't, take, I don't tolerate fools lightly. <laughs> and they're a very strong Christian, but I don't tolerate fools lightly. And I always think, well, you know, God does. God does. And he wants us to become more like Jesus. Jesus tolerates fools all the time. It's kind of his thing. And when we're meant to be coming more like him, and, you know, some people, you know, they're not good listeners, so they don't listen. There are other people that I've just got to tell people off, you know. If they're getting under my skin, I'm just going to tell them off. That, that's just me. That's just me. You may, I, I'm like that. Well, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Be more careful how you say things. Be more careful. You know, do you really have to give that person a piece of your mind? They probably don't want a piece of your mind. You know, they're not interested in a piece of your mind. Just, you know, weigh those things up. Get your jacket of tender mercy out and your humility and your gentleness and think, maybe I don't need to chew that person's ear. And, you know, it says, make allowance for each other's faults. You know, in that, the patience part, it actually means, it has the idea of a candle with a very long wick that allows it to burn for a very long time. We're all meant to be candles with very long wicks that burn for a very long time before they go out, because candles don't explode. They just go out. And we're meant to be just hanging in. And it says make allowances for each other's faults. You know, one day we're all going to work out We've got faults. We've all got them, and we all bring them to church. None of us leave them at home. We bring them in. We've got them in our little trolley, and we drag them in behind us, and we plop them down in the chair, and they're, that, they're there. We've all got them. And this idea that somehow or other we don't, and that people have got to act a certain way, or they've got to shape up to please me or to be right for me, it's just rubbish. Yeah, it's good. I'm not saying we condone sin. I'm not saying, you know, that we can't change. I'm not saying that as we yield to the Holy Spirit, we won't grow, and, and that 
things won't drop off, they will. You know, we will get better. We, but, you know, you only have to go over to the morning tea table to know we've got faults. And, you know, I just, Tracy, Tracy is the most amazing person. Pam, the most amazing person. Linda, the most amazing people. They set it up. They stand there so beautifully. We all just barge over. They've got special dishes for tea bags and milk and this and that and something. We just, but you got this? Yeah? All right, where do I put the tea bag? I'll just drop it here? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sugar's going everywhere, milk's going everywhere. Father, we just People are picking up cakes, putting them down against the trees. They just stand there, together, very calm, sweet. Uh, and just as they're packing up, someone just up says, Can I have a cup of coffee? Oh, well, we've run out. Can we make another one? Time, you know, we've just, we we've got faults. Seeking your face, Lord. We know that and we make, we need to make a revelation of blessing. Um, the of Lord, you working in our lives, and I pray, you know, Lord, we would have revelation on. Oh, I know a lot of your faults, <laughs> and you know a lot of my faults. So, I, make allowance for people's faults rather than yeah. pointing them out, yeah. Yeah. and talking about them behind their back, or saying to someone else, oh, "Don't go over there; they spill the sugar." <laughs> uh, oh, there you are, Tracy. I couldn't see you before. Yeah, just, just ready. She's ready. She's ready to go over there. So when the service finishes, <laughs> you'll all go over there, and cups and sugar will be everywhere. <laughs> you ready, Tracy? <laughs> but she makes allowances. She just smiles and helps. Pam's the same. Linda's the same. Just they all just. That's just one in one one example, you know. But. Scripture says don't point faults out, don't get irritated, make allowance. Just Very good. work around it. Okay, I might end there. I've got some more, but I might end there because I'm going to just spend some time. Trick <laughs> <laughs>